Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Okay. I just need to really seriously stop that and welcome you to Friday Inspiration Live for photographers and other inspired creatives. Today, I'm so excited. I have my friend Lee Varis. I tell you, Getting this guy nailed down and and in here, it's been like a like a cowboy roping contest. Like, am I going to catch the steer this time? Boom! So we finally got him. He literally got home last night from traveling. He's leaving again in a minute. The guy's busy. <laughs> He's so busy. Hi, Lee. How are you? Hi. <laughs> Lee Hi. is for those of you who don't know Lee. I don't know how you don't know Lee. He's an educator. He's a photographer. He's a digital imaging genius king of all he's been doing all of this for decades um i asked him to share a whole bunch of parts of his world he's also a musician he's my friend i I just he blows my mind on a daily basis so um hi so you got home last night yes so what time what time uh we got home around it actually wasn't that bad like seven or so still but it you know it took us an hour and a half to get back from the airport which is like an hour longer than it should because we were driving in rush hour traffic but yeah we were at the florida uh birding and photo festival for a couple days and then went back to california um for my son's wedding oh that's what prompted it okay i knew it was a family uh, event i couldn't remember hung out for a couple days there and we we just got back we're going to be leaving to go to new york we have a a photo tour the the neighborhoods of new york oh my god i wish i was on that so, one yeah that is you know sort of a street photography thing but we're going to be going into all these different ethnic neighborhoods um um and uh it's it's not it's sort of the non-trip advisor trip so when you go out and you teach you're leading a photo walk and everything are you focusing on teaching lighting teaching photography because you do something different every time right yeah i you know, I'm I'm sort of more of a generalist now. I, I do everything, uh, although for the most part, people know me and, and remember me as, you know, being sort of the king of post-processing. So, you know, I've, I've done a lot of teaching of Lightroom and Photoshop, and, you know, I have some online courses uh, available through my website where, uh-huh. I, you know, screen movies step-by-step, and it's all kind of workflow and... Yeah. You're so genius at it. I was just thinking, okay, I want to get into this sooner than, than later, because when I talk about you to other people and like when I was creating the the promos for this and going, how do I describe Lee? (laughs) How do I, and I was like, "Mm, no. So you have a, you have a, well, it's a presentation, but I just wanted you to show your work, show the breadth and depth of it. Cause I don't know how to explain you. (laughs) <laughs> you defy yeah. description to me. So do you want to share your screen and, sure, and let's, let's, let's just walk through yeah, Lee Varis and see. why you're so completely badass because you just are incredible. 45 yeah. years. Okay. People yeah. 45 freaking years uh, we're talking about here. So yeah, we're just going to go through this because um, I don't know any other way to share. So the part I didn't share in the promos and in talking about is that Lee did uh, uh, movie posters and promos, and you're going to see some of them. I meant to bring my Laura Croft in. I have a Laura Croft cut out, and you did Laura Croft Tomb Raider as well, the yeah. one with Angelina Jolie. Oh, my God. Anyway, go All for right. it, baby. So, so uh, just uh, I, I've been I have had a long career in movie posters. Uh, this is probably my most famous image and my part of this because movies movie posters is sort of designed by committee you know so I shot the moth this was (laughs) this was the simplest job I got this moth in a in a box from the moth lady or the bug lady in Hollywood oh my god somebody that collect you know that rents out bugs if you need them and uh, so I got this little box and this is actually, uh, this moth is called a death's head moth and it actually has a marking on, on its back that looks a little bit like a skull. But what people don't realize is for the movie poster, there was a whole other photo shoot where we put bodies uh, in the shape of a skull. So it's kind of an homage to Salvador Dali. 
right? Oh, wow. And it doesn't hit you right up front, but if you look at the poster long enough, you will find this. And one of the funny stories about this is that the MPAA, which is the the censor board, the self-censoring, you know, movie industry decides what's kosher and what isn't. Um, they decided, oh, you can't have nudes because they were actually nude. You can't have nudes on a movie poster. <laughs> about the size of my thumbnail on right on the right you never know i never knew i saw this for so, years I, so I was... what, what they did was they just they penciled in like a little hemline on the body suits that the models were wearing so actually in you know if you hear that in re reference to anything in hollywood oh they were wearing body suits that's code for they were butt naked <laughs> oh oh my god that's so uh, going from, you know, my most famous image to the, the most, you know, obscure one, this was the first key art. We, in Hollywood, we call these things key art. They get used for, in this case, it was a video box cover. They get used for movie posters, billboards. So key art is anything that is artwork that's created to advertise a movie. So this one, um, this, I had a, I had a gig working for uh, RCA Columbia Home Video when they first got started in in the home video market, the home video industry. Um, there used to be all these mom and pop shops that would rent home videos. And the thing that sold a movie was the cover of the box. And they were desperate to get content out and they were pulling movies from their archives. And they had this really bad B sci-fi movie that had only been shown in the Southern drive-in circuit. So they didn't have any artwork for it. And it was an absolutely dreadful movie. But <laughs> the story involved transplanting old people's brains into young bodies. So we, what we did is we mocked up a scene here uh, to, to just tell the story of the movie. <laughs> and there is nothing in the movie that is this good, <laughs> that looks this good. Oh, my God. That's how that happened. So did you did you take this did you take this image or did they give you the image and you created the art out of no, it? no they said here here's the movie figure out something to do to sell this so in this case because it was oh. something that nobody was paying any attention to they were just trying to get product out i had full creative reign so i i, I got a prop master to come in and build the, the set with these these props and uh, i i enlisted the the help of some friends to be the models and uh, hired this guy to be the mad scientist. And of course, none of these people are in the movie. This is just <laughs> trying to sell the idea. And it's a black and white. It's like a really cheesy, bad B movie. And this makes it look like a million bucks. So right, right. Rent, right. And, you know, that was sort of the beginning of my career. I was doing video box covers. And then wow. after a while, I kind of graduated to movie posters. This was another one of my favorite ones. And this was this was one where I kind of did everything. I did the photography and the Photoshop compositing. And it's a stock picture. One of the skies from my collection of skies. And in Hollywood for a while, I was the king of skies. So whenever there's a sky in a movie poster, that was my stock. Um, but um, I got I was an early adopter of digital capture. Uh, this is this movie poster represents the first use of a digitally captured image on a movie poster, and it's this blue eye. So there's a funny oh, story. Oh, neat! This was with a Kodak DCS 200. It was the first Kodak digital camera it was built on a Nikon body, and it had a cable that ran out of the camera into a whirling hard drive that was in a little pack. You put it over your shoulder and. Um, about four megapixels this capture i remember those digital cameras i didn't have that one i had another one that was probably it's it's com, you know compatriot yeah and the other images were 35 millimeter slides and what happened was they had this poster all ready to go to to press and i my client calls me up and he goes the lawyers have killed this poster i i need to replace the eye because we were using michelle pfeiffer's eye and their the lawyers are worried that somebody may recognize her eye. <laughs> so wow. he was like, I, I know you're kind of been experimenting with digital capture. Can you get me an image by this afternoon? And this was already 11 a.m. Oh. 
And I was like, sure. <laughs> Down some random girl, got the eye made up and all that. Took the picture, got him the file at by two o'clock. He had everything. They did this. They swapped it out on on the uh, Quantel paint box. This is prior before Macintosh. This movie came out in 1991. So that lets you know how far back this was. I mean, th nobody was shooting digitally for movie posters at this time, but this solved the problem. And when they got that file in there, they realized that it was sharper and cleaner than the 35 millimeter slides that they were using. They had to actually blur it slightly and add noise to it to make it kind of match um, the existing uh, photography. Man. So after this cluster came out, I got calls all the time about doing digital because in Hollywood, it's all about, you know, how fast can you turn it around? Right. I know I do voiceovers so, and it's like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, so I, I did quite a few uh, things. This was uh, an image I did for National Geographic and uh, the photographer actually was Louis Sahoyas. He later won an Academy Award for a documentary movie. Um, anyway, Louis came in, he was a National Geo shooter and he was renting my studio and he had this idea, he didn't know how to do it. He didn't, and so I was chatting with him. I said, well, you know, we should shoot green screen and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, you're gonna have to shoot the chimps at, with different lenses to get the different perspectives, you know, because right. he's in the background, you know, it, the ones in the foreground can be wide angle lenses, but these guys back here. And after a while he was like, hey, do you want to put this together for me? And it, it was like a month's worth of work. Oh my, because you had to do uh, them individually. We had to, you know, drop them in individually. Ooh, this, wow. again, this was a very early, this was in the early nineties. Uh, and um, software, you know, Photoshop would, couldn't handle this many layers. So I was <laughs> using a program called Live Picture, which was a trick program that's, that's now dead, but there's over a hundred layers in here because there are a hundred, exactly a hundred chimpanzees. It's all one chimp, by the way, named Archie. He was a, like a six-year-old and we shot him for everything, composited everything uh, together. And um, when I had finished it and I turned the file in, uh, Louis, <laughs> obsessive compulsive that he was, actually counted them all and he called me up and said, Lee, there's too many. You have 103 chimps in here. You have to take out three chimps. You know, like, uh, you know. He wanted yeah, the hundred, he wanted the hundred monkey. He wanted the hundred monkey thing. Oh my God. Well, the, that, as it turns out, the actual quote is an army of monkeys. If you give an army of monkeys <laughs> typewriters in enough time, they'll type out Shakespeare. So oh, these are prototype Mac Macintoshes. Uh, they were, this was a balsa wood model. And oh my I, God. I had, uh, I had, a my studio manager really rose to the challenge here and she wrote out all these simian versions of Shakespeare. So all of these <laughs> screens have, you know, Mac beast, you know, so instead of Macbeth, so they changed the, the text a little bit to represent, you know, monkeys or apes or, you know, um, it, it's pretty funny, but, uh, after I after I did this and appeared in National Geographic, uh, I got all these calls to do multiple animals. So one of my multiple animal assignments was this Alice in Chains, uh, the Jar of Flies album cover. I did the album cover. For the album cover, what I did was I created the embossing, which they wanted to look like it was on the out, other side of the jar for some reason. And I put in all these flies. So this is for the billboard ad. They wanted the flies to come out of the jar. And so I'm, I'm like literally pasting little, I made little fly brushes so that I could. Really? Them. Oh my God. Uh, I mean, crazy. some of the larger ones are actually images composited in. I did a little motion blur on the wings and, and the art director said, this is really amazing. How'd you get those flies to flap their wings? <laughs> no. Yeah. No. Oh my God. That's incredible. I mean, what's, I mean, that's a lot of work now, but what's incredible is when you did it and the technology that existed. Yeah, it then. was all manually masking everything. Ooh. I mean, I remember, you know, doing voiceover and editing and video editing when we had, um, 
you know, when it was manual and the razor blade and the tape and the, you know, the whole nine <laughs> yeah. yards. So I, I know the equivalent. I wasn't doing photography back then, but I was doing that. So gosh. Okay. Still life go. So still wow. life. I, early on in digital capture, I was using a camera that shot color images through colored filters. So there would be a little filter wheel that would swing through and go red, green, and blue separate exposures in, in the camera software would put it all together. And I realized pretty early that if you moved the lights in between these filters, you could generate all this kind of what I call false color. Oh, interesting. This is just sort of an example of that. I, I moved the light around. Took, every time I took a, another exposure through a different red, green, or blue filter, I moved the light. So because oh, wow. the light is displaced, it's, it's giving you these rainbow colors and where they overlap or where they don't overlap, you get you know, different colors. So, so how would somebody do that now? What would they use? Um, it's funny you should ask, because we'll see something a little later uh, that I use a Fuji camera and uh, the, um, the Fuji camera has a really robust system for multiple exposures in, in camera. Yep. I know and the one well. That's really one of cool. the, one of the uh, modes that you can employ. It's not just like multiple exposures, but you can, you can use lighten, darken, or uh, additive. So if you do additive and you right. shoot through different, you know, you swing a different filter in front of the lens, when they add up, you can get some similar results. Interesting. Okay. And it's a whole lot easier than what we did back in the day. Because you had to do this and then combine them in Photoshop, right? Or in something. Well, in, in this particular case, the camera did the compositing because it that's what it did. It mm. took three shots in order to get one color shot. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, later on, I, I, I started using Photoshop layers to achieve this kind of thing. And there's a whole, you know, I have a course on in my uh, online school about I call 21st century lighting. And it's all about these trick digital lighting, lighting and layers and all these different. Uh, Neat. Types. Okay. Okay, I don't want to stop you. I just get to see things, and I'm like, wait a minute. This was a, this was a demo image I did for a live picture. They had a they had a distortion brush long before Photoshop did, uh -huh. and so you could warp things, and that's how this was made. Oh wow! Another uh, live picture composite here, um, and here I'm going to show you the. This was a this is a Fuji in camera multiple exposure, where it's. Uh, the average mode, which is kind of like it just blends the images uh, together. So if you take three exposures, they'll all be given equal weight. If you take four exposures, they'll all be given equal weight. So you can take up to, I think, nine I think it's nine. I think it's nine images. Yeah, nine, because that's that's how far it counts. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I've been fascinated with this, and I had not hadn't really played around with it until recently. Bobby did a, a, a Fuji Love article about the multi exposure, and then I just you know I I went crazy with it. Here's uh, the additive mode, um, and so do you? I don't, I don't understand what additive does exactly. Like, how does that work? Like, what is it actually it's doing? A, it's a simple. Uh, it's a very very simple um, mathematical algorithm that just adds the brightness of the pixels to that previous shot. So because it's adding on top of the existing pixel, so you see where the red yep. overlaps, the green one turns yellow, the blue over the red turns magenta, and everything is added on top of it. So it's not averaged. It's literally adding light with each multiple. Each would, that, would that be the same as... Um a blending mode add you know yeah, it's, uh it's like add blend mode in okay yeah. okay exactly exactly so there's a question there's a question in the chat which says what are you moving the light the zoom the camera in this case yeah i'm i'm zooming i'm move offsetting i'm actually hand holding the camera and zooming and moving the camera and, and what happens in this fuji system is you can see a ghost image of the previous exposure so you can line up your your shot take another shot, then you see another ghost image with those two shots, and you can kind of play around. You can actually see it as you're going along, how yeah. to compose it, um, which is really awesome. And uh, mm -hmm. it's an incredible all feature. All these, all these possibilities. Here's a, 
another one of that, but in this case, I'm but besides moving the filters over the lens, I'm defocusing the lens. I have, have one shot that's focused and then uh, two shots here added to that that are out of focus. And that kind of blending, uh, you can kind of see it in camera so you can line things up. Um, I actually, this one I think I shot on a tripod, so I didn't have that camera movement. But um, it's a lot of fun to play with. And I just, I just, started doing this again and it's i'm just the tip of the iceberg there's lots of stuff that i'm there's planning. um that's a, that's an awful lot of fun and the other thing about that go back for a second to that image so it looks like what you did was um make some adjustments in photoshop like do it in camera but then you know the the it does shoot the composited image in camera so you get that yeah. as a jpeg but it also le you also get yeah. all the all the images so you could fine-tune it yeah, yeah. so you, so you can fine tune it in uh, yeah. in Photoshop with layers and stuff. So I mean, you know, frankly, everything I shoot ends up in Photoshop. Yeah, <laughs> it, I know. Me too. Because, <laughs> you know, it's just not finished unless you polish right? it. I know. I, see, it's everything's a show. It's got to be. Okay, carry on. So uh, this, this is so is, cool. I, I'm kind of an amateur musician and I, I have a lot of exotic instruments. This is an oud, which is the Middle Eastern lute. And okay, I've how did I, two shots here? You know, show you the front, and the back. You know, how did you get? Wait, if you composited it, yeah, I shot, I shot the oud front, and I shot it the back, and I yeah, but you got the shadow. It. Did you put the shadow of the front one onto the back one, or how did well, you pull that yeah, off? Of course. Okay, I'm just <laughs> checking. You no, know, it wasn't there. Yeah, no, that's just you know simple soft brush just kind of brushing that shadow i know people are always curious about that um what was i going to ask you about this oh ood or oh, what the heck well I, how did you <laughs> i i don't even know what to ask how did you learn to play it why how did this happen i just became fascinated with it uh, i mean i have greek heritage my on my father's side and uh this is a you know it's a middle eastern instrument but you find it in turkey and greece uh and um, a, a friend of mine got got me a CD of Munir Bashir, who was a very famous oud master, he's long dead now. But uh, it was a concert where he he just improvised from the beginning of the concert to the end. It's all improvisation, and I was wow. just fascinated with this not only the sound of the instrument, but just this whole uh, this whole repertoire of improvisation which is really different than what we think of as, you know, improvisation. Um, and the whole musical system is, is radically different. So I, I, I really kind of went down a rabbit hole with this. And for about 15 years, that's all I played was oud. <laughs> oh and God. I didn't play guitar and I came back to it finally. And, you know, well, that's so how you do it. I, you you got to immerse, you know, to really yeah. learn something. Wait a minute, back up again, back up again. Have another <laughs> question. There's one more question. Yeah, that, so it's on dunes. Is that sand dunes? Yeah. This is, is that, another, it's another is shot that, of sand dunes that I composited in the background. It's, is that Death Valley? Where is that? Uh, it's either Death Valley or Dubai. I can't remember where. <laughs> it is, Only I, you would have that as an option. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's so cool because I'm always also fascinated by the choice of backgrounds and the choice of um color and um you know well, here I, yeah i'm kind of going forcing the, the color contrast cool colors recede warm colors come forward right so i'm putting cool color in the background to make it you know go into space away from the viewer and and the, the warm color of the instruments coming forward so it right. makes it a little more three-dimensional and and of course blue and gold are complementary colors, so that's always going to work. And and then you made those sky totally black. I mean, I just those kinds of choices are the ones that actually really make the image. And so that's why I uh, you're such a master of all that that I it just thought I just wanted to look at it for a second and think about why you did that, you know, artistically speaking, because um, it's so interesting. And I also really love the lines of the oud and the lines of the you know the, 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 the geometry of it all yeah it just works on so many levels that it kind of messes with my head <laughs> i love it okay okay okay
Okay. Carry on. So Carry on. A, a more recent uh, in, instrument. I got kind of interested in uh, gypsy jazz. So oh, this I love is a, gypsy a, jazz. A type of guitar. You see the floating bridge here. Yeah. Uh, this is um, what they call a D hole or a grand bouche uh, gypsy guitar. Uh, and I, I, I actually don't play that much gypsy jazz, <laughs> but I do love the sound of these guitars. And, uh, and actually the one behind me here is a, is a gypsy guitar. I wondered if it was the same one. My husband's a um, professional bass player and he plays with a part sometimes with a gypsy jazz uh, band. And I oh, always, I always love going to those gigs because I freaking love that music. Oh, it's great. All right. So wow. Moving Beautiful. Uh, okay. Sorry. Another, I, I geek out another, on instruments. Uh, this is another uh, of my interests, a long-term project. I've been doing these uh, tarot card images. Uh, eventually I'll have a full deck, but right now uh, I Whoa. have the, this is the fool is, is the trump card in the, in the tarot deck that is also shared with the regular playing card deck. So regular playing cards have, you know, um, have a card like this, you know, a fool or a, um, a joker, it's, you know. Uh -huh. um, Is that a young Richard Dean Anderson? No, this sure guy looks like him. God, it looks guy, just like him. Uh, actually, he was a he was he, he dressed up like this and, and did juggling and stuff for uh, Renaissance fairs and things. So, oh, wow. So I had to, of course, cast him in the role because he was he had the costume, you know, the whole thing. Right. So all of the, this, there's the magician. Uh, these are very scrupulously researched to kind of go with the sort of, uh, it, it's pretty much based on the Golden Dawn school of magic, uh, which is a, a, an American kind of uh, <laughs> magical society that was you know, popular at the turn of the century. Anyway, they, um, they developed the Rider Waite tarot card deck, which is the most popular you see. That's the one you see most of the time. Mm -hmm. And these images were kind of takeoffs from that, uh, from the symbolism in those uh, uh, tarot cards. So I just, you know, I made more elaborate uh, composites and uh, there, there's Hebrew letters and astrological signs. And um, the, 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 Imagery is also very specific, has all, all these kind of symbols in it. Right, right. Um, you know, the, the Empress, and we'll see the Emperor next. So, uh, you know, sort of the Venus and Mars cards. Um, uh -huh. And there's the Chariot. That's, uh, that's my card, actually, just based on my birthday. Um, so that's a picture of me in there. In the, in the <laughs> that's um, awesome. That's that makes you kind of like uh, Stan Lee, you know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. always appearing in his own movies. <laughs> so these are so the in, you know in the in the tarot card deck there are twenty two trump cards. So instead of one joker, they've got twenty two cards, and uh, these are the most iconic tarot cards. So the other tarot cards are royalty and number cards. So um, much like regular playing cards. But I started with these since either these are the kind of the most iconic. Um, so what are you going to do with these? Like, what's the plan? You're, you're working on it, but what what uh, ultimately well, do you hope to do with them? Eventually, I'll have a full deck and uh, then hopefully I can get it published. There's there's basically one publisher of tarot card decks, but they won't even look at your cards unless you have a full deck, which would be 70, 74 cards. So I've got 22 done plus a smattering of royalty cards and I'm still working on it. <laughs> wow. So I thought I'd throw this in there. I can't really compete with Karen and then, <laughs> but I've got a few that I like. So I throw them in here. You know? Good. Cause you know, this is, okay. so I said to this to you, I can't get my words all backwards here. I get so excited. So earlier before we started, I said, um, the, one of the reasons I wanted you to show all of this is because so many people think, oh, I have to specialize or I have to only do this. And how do I, how do I frame my world? Because I'm multi-passionate and I like doing all these different genres and stuff like that. And I'm like, wait till you see Lee. 
<laughs> granted you've been at it a long, long time, but here it is. You, you're doing landscape, you're doing digital art, you're doing movie posters, you're teaching. There's no reason you can't do it all, right? Don't you find that to be true? Well, you know, I, I've, I've, I've gone through phases and I still go through phases where I'll, I'll just concentrate on still lifes for a while or I'll do, you know, we, we lead travel tours. So this is mm -hmm. from our tour to Iceland, which we do every year. And, uh, you and know, we did Venice this year. Yeah, we did. We always do Venice for Carnival. And we'll see a few images like that uh, mm -hmm. a little bit later. Oh, um, so beautiful. So, you know, Iceland is 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 a landscape photography tour. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what you got. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I I just do a little bit of everything. And recently, I've really fallen in love with infrared again. I mean, I shot infrared film for for a long time. I was mm -hmm. experimenting with it, uh, and digital capture now makes it really easy to get uh, have a lot of control over the color uh, of a certain certain infrared conversions allow you to capture some color as well as these sort of invisible infrared. Uh, so it always does something really wild with the color. These are green. This is green grass. Uh, oh, wow. Infrared, it glows. It has because it reflects a tremendous amount of infrared light. And the things that are gold uh, are the water absorbs infrared light. So in the color infrared capture, you can get these this sort of it's almost a like bicolor kind of you know opponent color range. So you yeah. get it warm, uh, and you can shift them around. Uh, but uh, it, it's it's a lot of fun. What camera are you using to do this? Do you do you dedicate one for you have one outfitted for? Yeah, infrared? I I have a couple of cameras that I've converted. Uh, the the one that I've converted to five ninety, uh, which is kind of the super color infrared is an X-Pro2. Oh, um, interesting. So you can convert them. I don't think I ever knew that. I always thought it was you just converted them for, you know, black and white, because that's what most people do. Right. So yeah. I've never, I've never, I didn't know you could even do it for color. So different conversions, the difference between the various conversions is how much visible light they also allow. Interesting. So the 590 nanometer will allow um, shorter wavelengths up to 590, which means a little bit of red and a little bit of yellow light can come in. Oh. So infrared passes through the, the red, green, blue Bayer pattern equally. So you can't get any color differentiation out of infrared itself. It's, it's basically invisible to the human eye. And so it doesn't have any color and right. it passes through all those filters equally. So if you do a, infrared only, uh, which would be like 830 nanometers. Uh, so only wavelengths longer than 830 can pass to the sensor. That's all in, invisible infrared. And so that's really only useful for black and white. Right. So I have some black and white images. This this is a um, an 830. Uh, that is cabinet. really cool. This is really different from infrared that I'm accustomed to seeing. You do it differently aside. And then the color, wait, the color one then appears color in the camera. It isn't yeah, so it, it kind of, it does require a tremendous amount of post to get it to look like this. Yeah, I wondered so about that. In, in infrared, just straight out of the camera, it's very soft and it doesn't have a lot of contrast. So even the black and white, and also black and white infrared film had a certain glow to it with infrared light that would kind of bounce around and create these highlight glows. Mm -hmm. So in order to get that in po in digital, you have to actually introduce that glow in post. So one of the tricks that I use, like in this particular image, I use negative clarity settings against positive texture slider settings and you oh, get interesting so the, the negative clarity gives you the glowing highlights but the texture in increases the sharpness of high frequency transitions so like the blades of the grass stay sharp but the highlight is now spreading and kind of glowing and it gives a sort of interesting uh look to the and it gives it a, a texture unto itself it's really interesting yeah <gasps> That's so cool. You really do it differently than, than I'm used to seeing. And I love it. Look at those bird tracks. So yeah, so this one, one of the advantages of wow. having 
the full color one is you could put a, a, a black and white 830 infrared filter, which you can't see through. It's just black. You put that over the front of the lens. With mirrorless, you can actually see the image because the sensor is still picking up the infrared. Right. And, uh, it cuts out all the color. So I can use it for black and white or uh, I take the black and white filter off and I got infrared color, which looks like this. So the filter makes it black and white. Is that what you just said? Well, the filter, the 830 filter cuts out all visible light. So it only passes infrared light and it's only useful for color or monochrome, you know. So in other words, you, you can't get a yellow against blue with a regular infrared. It's all monochromatic. In the camera, it, it just looks kind of magenta because mm -hmm. the white balance and it doesn't know what to do with it. So I just put a, you know, an Acros, you know, Fuji black and white film simulation on when I'm using the heavy 830 infrared filter. I see. Do you ever, did you ever make a course on all of this? So somebody got yes, fascinated by most, my most recent course on oh, my, is it? Because I'm just thinking, level. oh my God, you could really go down a rabbit hole. And how would you ever learn that? And then I, you know, well, yeah. you'd be the guy to teach it. So that yeah. we'll have to talk about that later. Tell everybody where they can go to. Yeah. So I, you know, I have I various learn. tricks for taking the color that's there and adding additional color variations and doing all kinds of tricks in Photoshop to shift the hues around. And um, there's, there's a lot of things you have to do to kind of get a decent uh, white balance because it's this color is so skewed in infrared that, you know, you have to build custom camera profiles and all that kind of stuff. And I, wow. I talk about that, all of that in my course. This was uh, infrared from uh, Venice uh, from our this last trip uh, in February. And um, and here's another one from the uh, other side looking at, you know, <clears throat> And so this has that little glow that was, yeah. added, that was added in Photoshop to give that little sort of Orton effect thing. Yeah. And then there's plugins too. You can do that in Luminar. You can do right. it, you know, creating, you know, layering some different effects together in Photoshop. That's pretty darn, pretty darn cool. So I have one more that from Venice that's not infrared, but I kind of felt it was fiery. So I, you know. <laughs> nice. So this, this was, uh, this used the, the pixel stick which you can kind of see these flames are, they're generated by this thin strip of LED lights that's programmable. You feed a bitmap image into it. Wow. And the, the, these red, green, blue lights flicker. And then as you move them through space, you can literally paint an image into space. So I had an image of fire and I just kind of waved it behind them in an arc here. Because their costumes, they were fire people, and you know, um, right. This, uh, and so we added the fire in the background, and that's it, when you see the process. It just, it's me wearing black, kind of running around, waving this thing around. <laughs> it doesn't look like anything until you. you it's a, like an eight-second exposure. I was just going to ask you how long the exposure was, because man, I can see where like their hands move, and that just adds to it. It's fantastic, but really. They're pretty darn still. I don't know how do they do that. Well, the, they're lit with a flash from the front. So all the light is behind them back here. So they were, they were pretty dark. And then oh, the okay. are behind them. So they're not lit by the flames. So they're lit by the front from the front with a flash, which freezes the right. Motion. Right. Yep. That makes sense. And then do you have to, uh, is it more than one exposure, um, you know, image? Do you have to then combine images in Photoshop? Um, it, sometimes, you know, if you don't get the ideal flames, you might add, you know, blend a few shots together. I mean, right. we took, you know, 20 shots like this. Uh -huh. Some of them were better than others. I think this one is pretty much all in one shot. Wow. This one worked that is out. so trippy. Now, see, this is like I'm, you know, landscape photographer. So this is something I would never do or even know how to do. So I'm fascinated with hearing you talk about it. I'm like, oh, my God, that is that's just and it's because I thought at first, oh, it's a reflection in a window somehow. Yeah, because no, just, we actually we set this up. We have like 10 photographers with us. And we go line them all up and we get this set up and we, you know, we 
flash. So we tell everyone, okay, open your shutter. We hit the flash and then I run in with a, you know, the pixel stick and paint the light in there. And then everyone finishes their exposure. So we all kind of synchronize it and I get all 10 people all have slightly different angles on the subject. So do you have them, how do you have them do it? Your students, do you put them on bulb? Do you have them do a time? Yeah, they have, have them, they can time or do bulb. So some, depending on the camera. I mean, most right. people. Fujifilm you, Fujifilm, you could set up the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, most of the newer cameras, they can do that. It's not a problem. Yeah. So, so we, yeah. go ahead. We, go ahead. We, we figure out the exposure, everything, everybody gets dialed in. And then it's, you know, one, two, three, open, and then flash. You know, we manually flash it while the shutter's open and then wow. paint the light behind them uh, all in one go. Holy cow. So you've already figured out it's eight seconds or whatever, however much time it is. Yeah, we figured out, you know, it, it, we've done this enough times. It's always eight to 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. That's so cool. Thank you. That's so cool to find out the behind the scenes thing. Cause I see you guys do this and I always see the finished product, but it, you know, we're always all of us running so fast. I never get to stop and go, now, wait a minute. How'd you do that? That's very, very cool. Okay. So the other genre that I do, of course, is portraits. Uh, and, uh, you know, we teach a, uh, uh, what we call Hollywood glamour in the style of George Harrell. Uh, uh, we do, of course, in Los Angeles. We've taught out here in, in Massachusetts a couple times, uh, and we're trying to do more uh, locally. But this, uh, we do this, um, this Hollywood glamour lighting course, um, every year in, in uh, Los Angeles. And this was, um, you know, one of the sessions you can cut this, this particular shot illustrates the principle of chiaroscuro, where we're arranging to place the highlights against the dark background. So the mm -hmm. lit side of the face is against a dark background, the shadow side of the face is against a lighter background. And that that George used to use that a lot in his uh, and he was a famous for those who don't know he was a really famous photographer who shot like in the what was not in the 40s but he shot that old uh hollywood style portraiture yeah. well, you know the uh all those glamour shots uh you know uh um bearskin rug the you know all that all that kind of stuff was was his style and mm -hmm. so this is lighting in that style Right, so it's hard focused light, um, and uh, you know, very very dramatic. You know, I've always loved this kind of lighting, and I always love the shadows on the wall. Yeah, that that end up yeah. getting thrown. I, I I don't know which I love more. This this just makes me crazy. This one, oh. <laughs> this, you know, Loretta Young, you think, or yeah. you know, yeah, these, exactly. So um, anyway, we do that every year. This is this is my website, and you can find me on YouTube. I do like this uh, semi regular Photoshop rant. Yeah. <laughs> what do you <laughs> rant you about? Know, I always talk about something something about Photoshop, or it's not always a rant rant, but a, you know, yeah. A short thing. Um, and um, on my website, I have uh, this education menu. If you go to the online courses, um, you can find uh, all these step-by-step -step, um, video screen movie courses where I talk about it step-by-step uh, -step how to achieve these certain effects. And I have all the work files associated um, uh, with the, the video. So you can open the, take the file, download it, and work with it along with me. Wow. That's cool. So, and the latest one is the, of course, the, the infrared photography workflow. That's the very last one that I have on there. So that's where people could learn how to do what you, what you were showing, how, how yeah. you did yours. That's cool. Yeah, exactly. And again, just, you know, remember Veris.com. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh-huh. That's it. So I'm going to stop sharing. Wow. 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 Let me see. Right. Let me refresh over here. See if we have any questions. Um, comments and questions and over here so those of you who uh, are watching who like my subscribers at you know karenhutton.com karenhuttonart.com um 
they come and they're part of the Zoom. So I'm always checking the chat here because the ones who are watching it live right here uh, usually have questions and things like this. Mostly it's just comments because we're all just going, wow, <laughs> that is so neat. Um, and then, of course, you can always comment on Facebook. And these will be also on YouTube. Um, and I'll share all the links, you know, when I do the final post along and I'll share, Lee, I'll share all of your links as well. Okay. And then, uh, and then that'll be, that'll be that. So, um, God, I mean, you've been doing this so long. So what, what's next for you? Like why? Okay. It's part, it's a two part question. It's really one question, but it, it just has a future and a, and a past connected to it. And it's like, I'm always, I always ask this of my friends who have done this for a really long time. It had kind of is like, why do you do it? What's your purpose behind it? What is the, what's the most fulfilling, satisfying part of it that keeps you going, which then leads into the forward facing part of the question, which is where to now, where to next? Like, how do you see this all going past uh, to future? You know, I don't know what's going to happen next. I'm, um, uh, we're right now, Bobby and I are, are trying to focus uh, more on the photo tours. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, we're, we, the pandemic kind of screwed everything up. I mean, we had, we had a lot of, we did a lot of work at uh, conventions and camera shows and all of that's gone. Uh, yeah. And the Florida Birding Festival kind of came back and we, we just did that. Um, but it, it was very small this year and um, the sponsorship from the various camera people is gone. Nobody is spending any money um, right. sending out speakers. So, uh, so basically it, it's all on us now. We're, now we have to kind of scramble and, and make up our own um, tours and presentations and workshops and, you know, just kind of throw it out there and hopefully uh, people will sign up. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it's a whole other it's a whole other world. I mean, those who want to do photography as a living, it's like you wear, you got to be able to pivot on a dime, and um, and and some people say, well, I should specialize. I want to make a business out of photography, and I should specialize. And I'm like, actually, photography is one of these umbrellas under which there are so many options and so many silos of business, and each one has its own handshake and promotional requirement and audience it's kind of cool and it's a, it's a blessing and a curse in, in, yeah. in both I mean, ways. You know, it, it, it's, there's nothing wrong with specializing if you can get the work. I mean, we, right. we still do some commercial jobs, but they're, right. you know, they've gotten fewer and further between. Right. And there are just certain things that I'm just not interested in. You right. Know. You do get, you do get your preferences straightened out yeah. as you get older. I notice I'm like, yeah, I don't want to do that. But we, I mean, we, we really enjoy, uh, we enjoy teaching. I'm looking at my mustache and not behaving. <laughs> um, and, you know, you talk about your hair having a life of its own, and this little like mustache wants to poke me in the eye sometimes. I know. I hate um, that. Uh, yeah, we uh, we we still do some commercial work, but you know that's you know that's sort of calmed down, and so we really are concentrating more on educating, and we both love it. I mean, you're so good at it. Oh my yes, gosh. Love teaching people. And I, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I don't have any secrets. I'm not hiding anything. Right. So I, I just put it out there, you know, um, everything I know, I would try to make available uh, to people. I just think that's so wonderful because there's so many people who have dreams and have an imagination. And I mean, I, you know, I focus on uh, when I do help people and teach, it's about freeing up your voice and your creativity and finding that place where, you know, it's all, it's all coming from the inside out and this kind of thing. And, um, it's so satisfying to help people bring their dreams to fruition because there's a whole energy there. And then like, I send people to you and Bobby for certain things that, you know, oh, you need to know that go there. They're the best. Um, because you guys are, are incredible. You're complete masters at what you do and you're masterful at how you put it across. And I just think you are both like treasures that oh, people yeah. should, that's one of the, you know, that's one of the many reasons I wanted both of you in this series, because I'm like, oh my God, you guys, if you haven't met Lee and Bobby, you're in for a treat and you're in for an incredible education. If that's what you're looking for. Um, 
do you want to play your guitar? Do you? I love I mean, the fact that you're looking at it here. <laughs> I know I've been kind of like looking at it going, I want to talk oh, photography. Right. But I, see, I, yeah. I'm also fascinated by my friends who like, you know, a lot of us have another art. You know, I have another line of art. You play music. You got many forms of art. Um, but I have a lot of friends who do other things. And look at is Oh, what? a OK, tell us about that guitar. This, this is a small pole or petite bouche. Petite bouche. <laughs> petite bouche. Or gypsy guitar. So, uh, all right. I'm, I've, I've got, kind of gotten fascinated with this partial capo. So I'm, I'm warning you, I put this capo on and it's only it's only fretting three of the strings. Interesting. It kind of puts it into a <gasps> sounds like dad gad tuning, but it's just a capo. I love it. So you're improvising like the oud. You're like being the, the oud master on guitar. <laughs> well, I sort of that's a kind of a, a harmonic minor sort of. Thing. I love it because it has a, a real mid, Middle Eastern feel to yeah. it, but it's not Middle Eastern. Wow, that is so beautiful. So what do you like? How do you see that? Don't put it down because I'm going to have you play us out at the end. You can, you can hang on to that, but I'm going to have us like go out. You'll, you'll have a little mood piece and then I'll end the, I'll end the recording and we can just play it out. But I just wanted to ask you what, so what, where does this live in you? Like photography has been a part of your life for so long. And where do you find the threads between music and photography and, and where that kind of exists within you? Um, you know, it's all uh, photography, music is all personal expression um and you know they're they're just like two sides of this of the same coin in a way you know? right um I so yeah i kind of think of music visually and i think of you know vision auditory you know, i like, hear it too hear is it. that I have friends. I have. I know someone who has synesthesia, where he actually hears the tones of the colors that he uses, and that crossed my mind when I was listening to you because your color palette and your color selections are different. You know, you got your own thing. I don't. Yeah. It's it's uncommon. Let's put it that way. I don't see them all the time. And then I listen to this music, and I'm like, oh my gosh, there it is. Now I'm hearing what I'm seeing. Um, in this in yeah, this I mean, odd not, sensorial not way I consciously try to achieve it's just that right that's it, what happens I mean, right that's that's why i love hearing my friends play because i'm like oh my god i hear their i hear their voice that comes through their photography in their music and i mean my husband's a musician so i have an ear for that anyway but that is I just think it's fascinating and I love it. And I love you so much for coming here today and sharing all this with everyone. Well, thank um, you for having me. You know, it's been a pleasure. Oh, it's just so much fun. So will you will you play us out? And then I'm I will say <laughs> goodbye. I'm gonna say goodbye to everybody and then you play us out. Okay. <laughs> thank you everyone for being here. I hope you come next time and join us for our instant for our Friday inspiration for photographers. See you next time.